and action. Welcome, everybody, to PMP Weekly, episode 181. It is 3rd of October, 2022. It is last quarter of the year. Oh, my God. Yes, it is. Spring is coming soon. It's okay. Yeah, well, eventually. (laughs) (laughs) Depending where in the world you are. That is so true. Yes, you're absolutely correct. So now... um, Today we'll have a Bert Janssen joining us. Uh, he is a senior engineer. I guess there were seniors. No, senior. I need to double check his title. <laughs> uh, let me check. So his card says senior service engineer. Service engineer, not a software engineer, but, but doesn't matter. An engineer who writes code for, uh, for Microsoft and, and Bert <laughs> is a well-known person in the community for .NET uh, SDKs for the Microsoft 365 and talk about the latest on that. And there's some cool development related on throttling and rate limits. So how can we handle uh, kind of a packing out uh, as the service is telling, no, 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 you're requesting too much information. I can't handle. Uh, and then it's like, whoo. How do you do that in the future? So there's some adjustments on that and a lot of other discussions as well. I guess let's not waste any time. Jump on the interview with Bert. Is that, ooh, let's do a PMP Weekly. We talk about the latest on the Microsoft 365. <laughs> My name is Cesar Yuman. <laughs> Hashtag PMP Weekly. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Valdemar Matigas, and we're doing it so streamlined. We've been doing that for only <laughs> four years already. I don't Something know, like that. Yes. Anyways, you can just see how long it takes for us to learn anything. Um, <laughs> I'm a cloud true. developer with Microsoft for Microsoft 365. And as Vesa said, we're going to talk to Bert about some exciting things around Hmm. Exciting things around throttling. Believe it or not, there are some exciting <laughs> things coming. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> and some other cool features, uh, what he's been working on and, and updates. But let's jump on the interview uh, with Bert, and we'll come back on the articles right after that. Welcome, Bert Janssen, uh, joining on the PMP Week episode 181. Um, uh, so you've been in the show a few times, uh, but it's been actually two and a half years since you've been in a show. So um, it's been a while. Um, we we do catch up pretty much on a daily or weekly basis. But can you can you talk about bit uh, for those who do not know you? Who are you and what do you do for a living? Yeah, I've been hiding under a rock for the last two and a half years, but now I'm back. <laughs> uh, 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 but yeah, uh, <clears throat> what I do for a living, I work for Microsoft uh, in the OneDrive and SharePoint customer engineering team, which is a team that, uh, as the name already mentioned, works with customers uh, and ISVs in particular. So in my case, I'm more working with the ISV side, uh, helping ISVs uh, get actually the most out of the SharePoint and OneDrive experience. Because uh, we tend to get questions from like, we want to achieve this particular scenario and we think doing it this way. And then we say like, yeah, maybe should you do it the other way around because that will be better, or more future proof and so on. So it's a bit of, of uh, helping coaching those ISVs. And in parallel, that also means uh, if we give guidance, we need samples, we need documentation, that is then via PNP uh, um, delivered to everyone. We don't make yes. something exclusively for just for ISVs. Everything we do, try to do is we want to scale it and make it available for, for the whole world to, to consume. Uh, but so but that keeps him busy from the ISV side. And then, as mentioned, PNP, um, quite active in PNP still, uh, already a really long time from the early, early days. Um, yep. And um, the focus today of currently is mainly around .NET, so uh, .NET uh, Core SDK, the new library, and .NET Framework uh, and modernization tooling. But mainly .NET. You don't see me that often doing <laughs> SPFX. <laughs> not saying that I'm not good at that. Hint, hint. But uh, uh, <coughs> yeah. That's, but it's it's basically the questions and the scenarios that what you're addressing is is more like a pack packet services than connecting yeah. to the SharePoint online and doing doing operations. Yep. So, so applications have front ends and still have back ends. So it is indeed back ends. Just .NET is, I think, one of the main languages still for back ends uh, today. Yep. At yep. least in the SharePoint yeah. world. Now you you mentioned something PMP Core and PMP .NET libraries. What are those? Can you can you uh, elaborate a bit for those who don't know? Why why would somebody care about the PMP Core library? Sure. Um, I want to maybe first. Give you a little bit of history back. Um, so uh, when we started with PNP, we uh, built what we call extension methods in .NET. Like if you have a, a web object in CSOM, you can then have additional methods on top of the web objects via adding a library to your project. 
that library was really successful, has been growing. Uh, I think, Vesa, you've been writing code there as well uh, in those days what? that you still wrote code. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I can testify, Vesa actually <laughs> did write did it work? codes. Did, did it work? Uh, I, I, I thought it was a bit foggy there. Bad. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, so but th that library um, evolved into PNP framework, um, which at that point, uh, we only support the chip on the line. We used to support on-premises versions. We said like, that's too much overhead, too much hassle. We do online only, so that's PMP framework. But still, that was then the old library uh, built like seven years ago, more or less. So it's not really well, well, the structure wasn't optimal. We wanted to improve things. Plus we wanted to also include graph calls and then provide um, our developers with a kind of a fluent API that Depending on the situation, use a SharePoint REST, uh, Graph, uh, or even see some calls. And that's what PMP Core SDK is. It's our new library um, that we recommend folks to use, um, which provides the fluent uh, developer model and abstracts away the actual API calls that you need. So user developer don't have to worry about like, hey, should I do this with REST or with Graph or what you just used to the SDK and under the covers, we'll, we'll do the proper calls for you. Yeah. And I think that one of the key points there is also to call out the, the coolness of the abstraction layer, which is as we get more and more features and APIs in the Microsoft Graph, we can flip to use the Microsoft Graph behind of the scenes without impacting the applications. So the applications we've been using for the BMP core, it's an abstraction layer, and then it will optimize the calls to the API surface, which is available, which is actually a pretty cool concept. Yeah, that's the plan. So we can indeed... Uh another cover switched implementation and use the developer. Assuming you have the proper permission set, if you only grant SharePoint permissions, of you course. switch to graph. But, but besides that, I think it, it will be seamless for you then, yeah. How, how, success, how successful the, has this library has been? So is, are people using them? I know the quest has. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, I think the .NET libraries are the most used libraries that we have in the PNP space, um, yep. ranging up to 200,000 tenants a month uh, using them. Uh, which is massive. I think if we go back seven, eight years when we started this and we imagined 200,000 tenants a month using something that we, we built as open source, we would just yep. say, like, what did you guys drink? Uh, you, you, that doesn't make any sense <laughs> at all. Uh, but, but actually, yeah. Aspirations, right? It's all it's, about it's reality uh, and the same with the volume of requests that is being made. I have yeah. to check the numbers, but it's in the billions tens of requests, of uh, yeah. tens of billions of requests each month via PNP components. And I, we're actually not even including everything, I think, because we just calculate where we have some level of seeing what happens, but uh, there's other things there that are even not included. So it's, it's, it's just massive. Yeah. And I think that if I remember correctly, from June 2021 to June 2022, that's the fiscal year, we had more than 1 million tenants using the, the libraries yep. uh, within 12 months. That's like mind blowing, 1 million wow. tenants. That, that also, also testify, tells something about the size of the service. Like, true, true, true. It's, 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 it's huge, yeah, Microsoft 365. Yep. It's just a massive uh, service. And, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, I think the one of the, so, so one of the, of, of course, let's say the reasons for this has been the fact that you and many others have been just evolving that library throughout the year. So you know, basically there's a new version gradually coming out. It used to be a monthly basis. Now it's more infrequent or frequent uh, from mm -hmm. that, but having that consistency and improving plus the backward compatibility, which is still there. Um, so which mm -hmm. is pretty mind blowing eight years with backward compatibility not breaking yeah. up things, yeah. that's we should sell cool. that. We should sell that idea to some other companies. But there's, there's some good ideas in here. There's some good <laughs> learnings. So, <laughs> Yeah, indeed, but it's, I think it's, it's also thanks to the community. Uh, yeah. In the end, most of what I do is just mainly merging work from other people. Uh, it's not yeah. that I'm writing all the code myself. Uh, so it's a lot of people still uh, contribute PRs to PMP Framework and PMP Cross Decay and, and that's how it, it keeps evolving. And thanks, yep. we'd like to thank you, thank everyone in the community for doing that. Yep. And always, I think it's like, we're, we're done. We have feature complete, but <laughs> that's the dream that I gave up. We never feature complete, we never <laughs> yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. It's always something yeah. else, something new, something but it, better. Uh, but it's actually pretty cool that there are hundreds of hundreds of people who've been contributing and being actively involved in this open source project. It's pretty mind blowing, actually, how wild, uh, how, 
the length and then also the scale and then the amount of contributions, uh, which is pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. And, and we can even, we want more, meaning if, if you're interested in uh, contributing, if you're like, uh, if you really appreciate .NET uh, and you like writing .NET, .NET code, meaning there's opportunities for you. Uh, we can help you get started there with uh, different types of, of, of things to do. Um, but so just feel free to reach out uh, and uh, I, get, I can help you get started in, in uh, contributing .NET PRs. Are there, are there any any areas into which you want to expand? Like I don't know, workloads or types of operations or anything. Um, one area that is still expanding a bit is our admin component. So we have an admin library uh, that, that you can separately kind of download and use. So you don't have to use it, but if you want, so in that area I still needs some further kind of growth. Um, also the team side. So we mainly support SharePoint and Teams because they're no, it is really close together and the covers yep. both work really well together. And, and from the SDK perspective, I also wanted to have like a seamless experience. You don't have to think about Teams or SharePoint, you just use our features and our functionality. So, but on the team side, we have the basics, but also there is some room for adding more advanced capabilities and uh, wrapping those in, in, in the SDK. So that could be nice areas to, to uh, work on. Uh, one other area is modernization. But that's maybe more internal thing. We still have to finalize that work there, uh, kind of porting the, the, the modernization code over from PMP framework to Core SDK. We're almost there, but we need to take the last step to, to get it finalized. Now, on, on that one, what does the modernization actually mean? Yeah, uh, good question, actually, because I'm just talking about modernization, <laughs> like everyone in the world knows Would about know. that. <laughs> yes. uh, modernization uh, is a short name for actually what we call uh, page transformation, which is technology that uh, reads old pages and old being uh, uh, classic wiki pages, publishing pages, blog pages, uh, even um, web part pages, all the classic page types that SharePoint has and ha uh, had and has, they can be converted to a modern page for a regular page. We, do, we should stop calling it modern page to a yeah, it's, normal it's no page that you would get. So. If you get a communication site, you <laughs> add a page, that's a normal, temporary so, page, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's not a modernization engine, it's a content contemporarization engine. Yeah. Something <laughs> like that. But <laughs> it, it is really being used, meaning uh, um, we had we have between 100 and 200,000 page transformations a month, um, which hmm. is a lot. Uh, so there's in the millions of pages that have been created uh, using this. And actually, uh, Volume-wise, is also people are really using those pages. They're not just creating them; they're being used as well. So we can have some some measures there to see that, like it also goes up to the 600,000, 700,000 page loads a day from those pages. So it's 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 nicely used, and and um, I think it's, it's important for customers that they uh, think about this. Um, yep. I know we know Classic is there and Classic pages are there, but it's kind of it annoys me a little bit if you have a nice modern site, everything looks modern, and then you click on a particular page and boom, you're back in classy because that happens to be a wiki page. Yeah. And that's for us your users, that's kind of not good because they have to context switch. Maybe people are trained on modern UI, they don't know any more the classic UI, but then they just brought back to a, to the classic UI by clicking on, on the link that points to an old page. And that's yeah. And it's in any way to change it. So we need to make uh, make a, a clear statement. And for now, the classic is still supported. The SharePoint Classic experience is, is yes. supported. But we absolutely want every single customer to use modern experiences. And of course, this modernization framework is there to help with that transition um, over from, from the classic to the modern. Of course, if you're a new customer, you would be like, what is that classic yeah. page again? I don't, what, what, I it, what is that? What, yeah. what is this? <laughs> If you're new, don't worry about this. You should be good. Yeah, and but I, I would say one of the cool things is also the fact that you can translate and migrate and transform from on-premises to the cloud. Can you talk about that a bit? That's that's something that Paul Bollock actually worked on, right? That's something that Paul uh, need kickstarted because uh, uh, I initially created the original framework for online to online. Yeah. And then Paul said, yeah, but I have customers and having SharePoint on-prem. Can we do something similar? Uh, so then we started working on that and. and uh, Paul did a lot of contributions there. Uh, but in short, what does it do? Uh, it enables you to connect to your SharePoint 2013, 2016, 2019 on-premises environments. 
and read a classic page, being a wiki page or a publishing page, um, and then create an equivalent modern page in SharePoint Online in the communication site, for example. Yeah. Hmm. And we actually do see that a lot uh, for publishing portals um, because people, when they have a publishing portal on-prem, you can either migrate it as classic publishing portal in SharePoint Online, the rest migration tools doing that, but then you still have a classic portal online. Yeah. And it doesn't yeah. benefit from all the optimizations, it's less performing and so on and so on. So not really a, a good state. If you do the work and do the change management with your users, because they have to move things around, things will change anyhow. Why not just uh, think about, let's think about a new information architecture, create it, uh, and then modernize the pages in one go. Uh, you read the classic page, create a modern page over there. Um, and th this is perfectly possible with the, the page transformation. Um, now, some of the newer stuff, what you've been working on is, is actually really interesting as well. I, I like the fact that the, the BERT is always focusing on, on solving these real business scenarios like modernization or creating pages and all of that. But then uh, you've been working on the on the scanner technology and then there's something coming with the headers. Can you talk about a bit on, on what are you working on and, yeah. and what the benefits for the ISVs and customers would be, or partners and customers. Absolutely. Let's start with, with uh, the scanner thing that you mentioned. Uh, <laughs> so um, it's not, well, it's not called scanner anymore. It's, well, nowadays we, we have a product which we call the Max 365 assessment tool, which is um, a framework in which there's different modules, um, assessment modules. Uh, there's currently, we have two assessment modules there, one for syntax and one for workflow. So the syntax module, allows you to uh, assess how well will syntax, how much value will syntax add to my tenant. Uh, it will analyze your tenant, it, it will find libraries where there's like a ton of files or a ton of folders uh, or libraries which are really wide. So if you have like a library with 15 columns or 20 columns or more, yeah, maybe your user isn't really happy to fill those metadata, that metadata. Maybe with syntax, you can build a model behind, user uploads the file, and the model pre-populates majority of the metadata, for example. Yep. Right. So that's the use case. Um, or certain file types, if you have uh, if you have uh, document templates in there, Word document templates, for example, you might be automating uh, document generation. Syntax, we have features there as well. So it tries to uh, kind of give the, the business people a view on what places in my tenant, which sites, which libraries uh, are complex and, and Using syntax will definitely provide a value add. Um, yeah. so that's one module, and all of this is free to use, open source. So you can just pull it down and uh, start using it. Uh, we don't have a shared to paste links, right? We don't do that here. But uh, um, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll add it on the plug. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Good. Uh, the other module is uh, around workflow 2013. Um, so uh, a while ago we deprecated workflow 2010. Back then, there was a separate module in the, the what we call the modernization scanner, the old tool, the predecessor of, of this one. And now there's a workflow module in the Microsoft 365 assessment tool, which does uh, something uh, similar. It just yeah. gets your workflows and spits out a nice Power BI report that you can use to analyze your usage of work for 2013, which can also easily upload to your Power BI service, share it with, with teams in your organization, and so on. Um, we're not uh, deprecating a retiring work for 2013 at this point in time, but um, but sooner or later we mentioned uh, that indeed that's something we are considering. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's why we already it's, pushed out the tool. So give folks yeah. plenty of time to to uh, already understand. The it is it is now 2022, and we're talking about workflow 2013. It's nine years between those terms, and workflow 2013 was introduced 2022. So it's now been a decade from introducing this technology. Uh, so it's yeah, inevitable. And it just works. Still works. And it for still many works. Phones, but yeah. 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 But it's inevitable sooner or later uh, we need to move forward to a more modern or more cloud friendly technology. So, absolutely. Yep. I think that's, that's key for. Uh, it also reminds me of the story like uh, once you're on the line, you're evergreen. Once you're on the cloud, you're evergreen. You always get the latest and the greatest. <laughs> and, and that's true. You need to do less effort, but you still need to do some effort to, to yeah. keep benefiting from the latest and the greatest uh, and, and yeah. staying on track with, with deprecations and, and just doing the work to get 
move off on a timely basis and not, don't have like a, an alarm at the very end because then you need to find budget, find people, find whatever to, to get things done. So better yep. being up front, do it uh, right away and then you're safe. Yep. Yeah. Um, the other uh, work, one of the other things I'm doing currently is, is um, uh, helping around throttling. Now, a bit of context there in my day-to-day -day job, uh, we talk with a lot of ISVs and throttling is a key problem that ISVs have, a key set of questions they have around my application gets throttled. Microsoft, what can I do about that? What's, how can I, I disable I throttling? throttling? How can I disable? Yeah. Yes. Can you yes. go how in the service yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and uh, change something for me and then I'm, yes, I'm good exactly. again? For, just for uh, next week, can you disable yeah, the throttling yeah. for me? Just for next week. So. And at a certain point, that quest, those questions made sense because we we were learning, but that's already a long time ago. Nowadays, it's a fully automated machine, and and you can't simply uh, make exceptions anymore. Um, so, point is, an application when it uh, does too many requests, it gets throttled. Um, Why does it get throttled? It gets throttled to save the service, meaning uh, you're not allowed in the tenant. Uh, there's like a you, already, you mentioned millions of tenants using PNP, yeah, for one million yeah, over the yep. last uh, year. Yep. So there's a ton of tenants in the same tenant that you, uh, same infrastructure that you are as a tenant, as uh, and we need to have a fair usage policy. And, and one tenant cannot jeopardize the stability and the performance from the other one. So it's kind of a balancing Safety system. Safety measure. Safety yep. measure. Everyone has it. I think every cloud provider has it built in. Otherwise, it's yeah, you, you, will, you will have issues. Uh, you anyway, mean that there's uh, no infinite at scale in cloud? What is this? Uh, what? Somebody lied to me. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> that's another one. So we had the evergreen cloud, hey, the infinite know. scaling cloud. Okay. Yep. That, that's a good, good, good session. We'll come to it. Uh, <laughs> In 2035, maybe. We'll <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when you... Um, <clears throat> And share up on the line, um, depending on the size of your tenant, so the, the number of licenses that you have, you get a number of resource units per time window. An example, if you have a small tenant, uh, like a developer tenant, uh, anything, anything, anything under the 1,000 users, if I'm not mistaken, you will get uh, 1,200 resource units per minute, which means you can consume those. If you go above those that threshold in a one minute time frame, you get throttled. Um, now we talk about resource units, not about requests, and there's a, a reason for that. Um, one reason is that the request A is very simple for us, request B is very complex, so there's a different yep. cost internally. The other reason is that uh, if there's a graph uh, equivalent uh, versus CSUM or REST call, um, we want you to use the graph equivalent because that will be more efficient when it comes to throttling. Um, so to factor in all of these different elements, uh, we don't talk about requests, but about resource units. So you hit your resource, resource unit limit, then you get throttled. Now that leads us to the, the new thing, which are the rate limit headers. So previously you got throttled, you got your four to nine, it will say like retry after 50 seconds. Okay, yep. you, just have to, you wait 50 seconds, you retry again and you're good to go. Um, but that's, not ideal because uh, you don't want to get throttled because you have those long delays in your application. Um, and with retry, with the rate limit headers, uh, what we'll do is when you're at 80% of your quota, you will get an, a return header, a response header saying like, hey, you have 1,200 resources okay. quota, you consumed 1,000, so you have 200 left. And that information, you can use it uh, or not, but it will be automatically provided to you. Um, but you use that to uh, say like, hey, I'm about to get throttled. Yep. Let's kind of delay Let's a little bit. Off. Let's yep. back off a little bit. Uh, and actually in the, in the headers, it also, in the, in the rate limit headers is also like saying like, back off like so many seconds. These are smaller oh. back offs, like uh, between one and 10 seconds typically. So at that point you just say, okay, let's back off. Uh, and then you have a short delay and then you continue again, which then enables you to just stay above the throttling line, uh, below the throttling yep. line. Yep. And as an end result is that you have a more smoother throughput um, and in the end also higher throughput in the same time window. 
Right. And that's the benefit. So you don't want the application to be throttled because uh, you get those long delays, things just block, stop. Yep. Um, and with this, you keep on moving along. You might have a little bit kind of slow down and then you again pick up and then again a little slow down if you get the rate limit headers, if you're closing, but you can balance it out and avoid getting throttled altogether. And yep. the sample I'm actually working on right away, right now is uh, allows you to play around and test that. So you can say like, okay, let's test Ooh. with rate limit on. It will send graph, uh, rest and see some calls to SharePoint. And then you'll see how it behaves and how it starts to slow down. And then you can say like, okay, no, let's turn off rate limit headers. Let's just use throttling and you see the same behavior. Um, and then you can compare things. The sample will have some graphs showing like, okay, what's the throughput with rate limit headers and what without? And then you can yep. really see what I'm talking about. Kind of those, uh, you get throttled, you have a full stop, then you go again, full stop. And with rate limit headers, you have more like a kind of curvy line, but less, less no full stops anymore. Yeah. Oh, that is cool. So. Will these so two things, right? So are the limits coming or ahead? Are they coming on graph or SharePoint APIs? Which of these two? And two, you mentioned that there is a sample that you will be able to use to test it. So meaning there is a way for folks to force the response so that they can see exactly what's coming back from the service. Um, let's first question. Um, graph see some rest. It applies to all of them. So throttling okay. rules apply to all calls and also the rate limit headers apply to every call. So you get them back via CSOM, uh, REST and Graph. For CSOM, you have to do some, I wouldn't call it trick, but it's a bit more complicated uh, currently to get to the uh, response headers in CSOM right. because it's like a closed framework. Uh, we're looking into making that easier, but there is a workaround, which I, I will show in the sample when I once the chips. Um, mm -hmm. Um, so that was question one. And question two was mm -hmm. how you can test that or how you can see that. Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because because you mentioned a sample, right, that, that folks can use this to see the difference. So I would expect there is a way for them to force service or the APIs to respond back with these um, headers. Right? Yeah. So th there is no like, uh, used to be in the, in the, with the throttling, you can specify a certain uh, URL parameter, parameter. and, and yep. then it will Test for, throttle you. 429 true, true, I guess that was something yeah, like that. Yeah. We don't have that here. Um, so, but what we, uh, what I do now in the sample is uh, just uh, hit, hit the system. Hammer the <laughs> service. No. Hammer the service. <laughs> no, but, but really, it's not, not not really that complicated to get throttled, in it. especially in developer tenant. Um, if you do five parallel threads, continuously handling SharePoint, you you will get throttled in less than a minute. So, mm -hmm. and that's fine. Meaning. You're not hurting SharePoint because we throttle you if you, if you do too much. So yep. it's, it's, yep. it's fine. So you can easily. That's why the throttling is there. So it yeah. doesn't harm the other tenants. So, but yeah. uh, one thing to note is only application permissions. So you, if you create, if you use delegate permissions, you don't get those rate limit headers. They only apply to application permission scenarios. Uh, so in okay. your test, you have to configure that properly. That's actually really cool. So, so where will we see this in practice? Is it is are we rolling out things? Are you you're, you're going to provide samples? Um, mm -hmm. Is it going to be then taken care of in core SDK or what's going to? Uh, that's a question. Thing. Yeah. So you're going to uh, PowerShell core framework, <laughs> PMPJS, CLI, yeah. so, so many step, PR to all these things, right? Yep. Eventually, yes. So there is a the first resource is the, the SharePoint Online Throttling document uh, guidance. We uh, reviewed that. We've, uh, that has been kind of reworked. Uh, that talks about the, the limits and, and the quota that you have. So that's a theory. Yep. Then um, the rate limit support is built on PNP Core SDK already today, optionally. So you have to turn it on yourself if you want to use it, uh, but you can turn it on. You can have a look at the code there. That code served as a basis for the example that I'm working on. It's not, okay. not yet published, but I, happen, I think it will happen fairly soon, doing some internal stakeholder reviews uh, uh, on it. But uh, once that's done, uh, I will ship it. So maybe this week, maybe next week, but fairly soon. Yep. Also, um, at the European SharePoint Conference in end of November, early December uh, in Copenhagen, I'm, um, ha I'm have a session about um, develop about APIs in general, like. And throttling is one of the areas that I cover in the session. So if you want to yep. learn more uh, or have specific questions about throttling, and you happen to be in Copenhagen, feel free to uh, jump in and ask questions. And yeah, 
it seems to hear that a lot of people will be in Copenhagen, which is really cool. Yeah, anyway. nice. Looking forward to it. Um, another thing I want to ask, and that is more of a philosophical question, right? Because you mentioned the headers, and you mentioned that they kind of suggest you back off. Mm-hmm. But I can imagine that call is like. Imagine that you have a hundred resources left, and you have within the second ten second time frame to reset the counter. Mm-hmm. If I have five calls left, I might have just as well just go through them and and be done. If I have hundreds of call calls left, I would want to wait, right? So, to what extent decision whether to slow down or not can be made in the SDK versus it's the job of the the dev who actually builds the app, who has the context of the full pipe go, going on, mm-hmm. that it's really on them to make the call whether they slow down or or not. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good remark and, and good observation because indeed, uh, to what extent do you need to, uh, when do you need to actually slow down and when can you continue and, and where do you draw the line? And that depends a bit on your application. Like uh, when I, ex- Built the sample and experimented with it. If you like 10 of 20 parallel threads, you need to have a bigger buffer because SharePoint will say like, okay, you're about you're at 10 percent or 20 percent, but if you have 20 or 30 parallel threads hammering, you already sent another 30 requests in before you get the process, yeah. the, the answer. So yep. and then you and you'll get throttled. So you have to balance it a little bit. And for that, the sample implementation that we have um, works with a, a limit. So as I already mentioned, as of 80% consumption, SharePoint will give you the, lim- the header, saying like, you consumed 80%, uh, be careful. Now in the sample, you can say like, okay, only if I'm about t- at 10% or 5% or 50%, you choose the percentage, only then I will uh, kind of uh, apply the rate limit headers. Otherwise, I just keep going. So if you have a single thread application, or just two threads, you might put it five percent because meaning that's good enough for that case. If you have ten, ten threads, you might want to have it at twenty percent. Otherwise, you still get throttled. So you have to, as a developer, play around a little bit and balance it out. Uh, that's um, that's how it works because you have if you have all those parallel requests going on, you don't want to send them everything to one pipe and then determine there. Uh, Maybe there are different patterns. Yeah. I took something which is fairly simple to to, um, to explain and shows the purpose without getting too overly complicated. Pretty sure there's more other patterns available there as well. Uh, yeah. Cool. Uh, now we're starting to hit the timing. Uh, what else? Well, what's going to do after limit. this? Rate limit. So, <laughs> <laughs> rate limit. We're hitting the rate limit. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> trouble, trouble, trouble. So. What what's going to happen next? What what else is happening um, uh, on the well? Let's do it this way. Um, we'll come back on the next week's thing after this question. So what's going to happen after rate levy things? Um, what are the things on your mind, and how how are you spending your day after that? Um, well, we have the usual uh, talking to ISVs and customers yep. uh, that stays. But uh, one area I'm also kind of quite passionate about is, is monetization, and for that um, we we have tools already out. We talked about optimization framework, about page transformation. Uh, there is some guidance scattered around uh, around how to uh, modernize, how to make classic things modern. Yeah. Um, but it's, um, in my view, the, the tools and the guidance is not optimized enough, not good enough. So um, I'm currently preparing to uh, write a new module in the Microsoft 365 assessment tool um, that will detect all classic usage in your tenant and will kind of give you like a scoring model. So you say like, yeah, you're, you're at 80%, 85% modern. Then you can drill down in different areas of classic usage. Um, so the idea is giving you like a score. How good are you doing on, on being modern? Yep. Uh, but also combined with actionable guidance, giving you a score saying, like, yeah, I mean, this is not, not really modern without giving you the means to uh, take the next yeah. step, that would be uh, n- not good. So we try to combine both, um, like giving you more detailed insight on, on classic usage uh, and then actionable guidance on moving to, to uh, moving that classic usage into modern usage. Um, and that's currently in the spec phase, so it's written down, uh, not yet coded, but uh, I think that's uh, next step is, is kind of finalizing the spec, re- uh, spec feedback uh, and then starting to write work on that. Cool. 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 Now, before we close, 
anything interesting happening this week? Let's do a round table. Let's start with Waldeck. Waldeck, what are you doing this week? Woohoo! Uh, celebrate the release of uh, CLI for N365. Last Friday, we had a release and our version um, hey. 5.8. Hey. Yeah, we're getting, we will, we plan to have another one in October, 5.9, and then we move to V6, on which, for which we will, we've been working on half a year or so. So, NR major, sixth year, I think, into the CLI. Uh, we break some things, unfortunately, but again, like that, that, that's just the price you pay for building something over time and learning as you go, and then basically adapting, trying to make a tool as useful and meaningful as you can while yep. keeping it also so manageable, right? So we're, we're working on that. Other than that, internally, let me think there are some, there, there is some internal work coming, um, so I cannot share anything about it just yet, but I hope that I'll, I'll be able to tell you more about soon. Um, and then another thing is, I will pass all over to you, Vesa. I'm watching my calendar. Uh, today seems like somebody played Tetris on my my calendar. It's just You're wild. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you were one of them. De that is defrag, absolutely true. Defrag <laughs> yes. your calendar. Yes. <laughs> Ah, uh, anyway, so uh, we're looking into doing uh, updated release on the on the Microsoft Viva Toolkit, which is an open source uh, community driven tooling. Most likely, we'll wait actually after the Ignite, so because Ignite is on 10th to is it 11th to 13th, so not this week, next week. Um, but getting stuff prepared for that one because the the Viva is is the, the adoption of Viva is actually going off the roof right now, and there's a lot of questions about the extensibility. So we're looking into having a bit of a tooling there uh, first as a community open source tooling and then we'll get it integrated most likely to the team's toolkit whenever the team's toolkit will get renamed to something else maybe we'll see so because viva is not about teams or maybe it is or maybe it isn't who knows <laughs> um <laughs> okay. the naming is always so confusing straightforward <laughs> yes <laughs> super straightforward other than that a lot of catching up and and uh baseline services and community calls and all of that so which which are going really well but i, I guess that's the main thing a uh, lot of lot of guidance in the pipeline as well Bert, what, what are you going to do this week? Anything interesting? Uh, things already talked about. I think for me, the, the, the sample, the throttling work is, is key priority this week. And a bit of off topic weather will be good this week. So I'll do a couple Biking. of bike rides. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there we go. <laughs> it is. You have to uh, uh, balance things, right? So that's also priority. Totally. Uh, uh, I would, uh, so... it's, get, it's autumn. It can start to rain <laughs> the week after, and then it's ah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's the problem. At least the, the skating doesn't. You can't do that on a, a wet tarmac. Uh, it's just impossible because it gets super. Uh, well, it's it's really dangerous. So you need and, uh, wets or intermediate. They, I I do have those as well, <laughs> but it's not as fun. So it's, it's closing in the, the season, unfortunately. A cushion under your butt. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's the one thing what I definitely need. <laughs> so that's why I'm looking into biking right now as well because <laughs> I, yeah, it I cannot fall anymore. Too, well, too many yeah. hits. <laughs> biking is safer, but I wouldn't. I well, guess yeah, it's, it's, it's not that, always safe. That's that's yeah. true as well. You need to be careful with biking as well, but it's a bit more safer than it's skating. It's definitely sure. safer. Than well, skating. I just yeah re recall somebody from our close group breaking back last year. Yep. So no, yeah, I wouldn't say safe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but um, thank you, Bert, for joining, and and thank on you by the way. Note. On the positive <laughs> note, and thank Don't you, Bert, for back. providing uh, great insights on the on the selecting a good bike. Um, we've been having that discussion on the side <laughs> as well. So, uh, those who do not know, Bert is really actually a professional biker, biker, right? So almost professional. Yeah, yeah. Oh, almost pro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> almost pro. GoPro. But wishing I was Bert. almost pro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <exactly. laughs> But thank you, Bert, for joining. Uh, and then we'll jump next to the weekly articles together with Waldeck. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. thank you, Bert. Thanks for having me. Anyway, so, so well, let's actually thank you, Bert, on the interview. <laughs> that, that was that was good. Uh, and let's let's jump on the weekly articles um, uh, to cover what has happened within the last week. 
So we'll start uh, with uh, a uh, blog post uh, in the Microsoft Teams blog, which is once again the great monthly summary, and this time from Holly Lehman. Uh, she is a, a in the product marketing of Microsoft Teams, um, and basically summarizing what's new in the Microsoft Teams within August and September. So really cool list of all of the great features and the quick demos and a lot of them as well. These are really, really valuable for end users and administrators and developers and everybody to stay up to date on all of the great, great, great stuff what we keep on pushing on the Microsoft Teams. So really, really thank you, Holly, on, on sending this. Oh my, this is long. <laughs> Jeez, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Which only proves, right, the amount of investments that we're doing in Microsoft Teams yes. to improve it for everybody. Yes, absolutely. Every single month, new features uh, rolling out. So it's just really, really cool. Uh, so. Now, the second article was from Mark Cashman around Microsoft Ignite. Um, exactly. As we're recording this, Ignite, Microsoft Ignite 2022 is just one week away. So for this week, uh, Mark shares with us a guide, basically what sessions are there around, can you scroll up a little, around Viva, Syntax, SharePoint, OneDrive, List, Stream, Project, and more. So this is like really nice reference post to have when you get to your session planner and you want to find things that you might find interesting. Yep, really, really cool summaries. A lot of, lot of sessions in Ignite again, uh, and a lot of great updates across the, the whole Microsoft 365 service stack from the, from the end users, the administrators, to developers. So really, really cool stuff. Now, uh, we also had a great blog post from Gary Trinder, uh, he's a cloud advocate, actually Waldex uh, teammate, uh, and colleague um, on building a stock update notification bot for Microsoft Teams using the Teams toolkit from Visual Studio Code. Um, so we really like focusing on, on telling the storyline around the value of what Microsoft Teams toolkit is providing. Um, and this is one of those uh, blog posts in, as part of that series. So how would you actually get started on building that first bot, which is then providing additional information using adaptive cards technology for showing the messages. So a lot of, lot of great uh, insights and steps uh, walking through how would we do this kind of a scenario. So super, super useful stuff. Thank you, Gary, on that. Next one, we had an update related on Microsoft Teams apps coming to preview in Office and Outlook apps in Android. A lot of information e to exactly. tackle. Exactly, right? So a while back already, we talked about Microsoft Teams apps coming to Office and Outlook. And the idea is, build once and expose the same app to multiple hubs, basically bring apps where people are. Now, apparently, there is new preview where you can expose these apps on Android too, right? So it's just not, you know, on the web or desktop, but also on Android. So if you're interested in the use case, that is yet another platform that you can now use with your existing investments to ensure that the apps you build for Teams will reach even more people. Really, really cool. Cool to see the continuous investments in this area as well. So awesome, awesome stuff. Now on the Power Platform side, we had a Power Platform Developer Tools monthly release update, uh, August, re August refresh, sent on September 26th, but it's kind of a recapture of all of the new features which are coming out. Uh, so what's in preview, what has been rolling out, and what are the capabilities which are available in the Power Power Platform tooling as well. And it's it's the uh, same applies here. A lot of new capabilities rolling out um, on a monthly basis. So thank you, uh, Karthik, uh, for that one. Now, can we uh, talking about your team colleagues, uh, Ike Bash? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I need to learn. Yes, <laughs> we haven't we haven't stood still, right? So here's yes. another article and another scenario, right? That shows what kind of things can you build on Microsoft Cloud? And we're saying on Microsoft Cloud because this spans Microsoft 365, serverless, Azure. So it's multiple technologies coming together into an app that you reasonably speaking might build for your work. And in this case, you will learn about how you can automate the onboarding experience of new employees. If you're interested in this case, check out the article because the, the app you can build is really cool and you can do it pretty fast. Yep, really, really cool. Thank you, Aisha, on that one. Now, you probably want to talk about this one as well. You mentioned this in of the course. discussion with Bert. Of course. When it comes to CLI from Microsoft 365, I want to talk about it every single time I get the chance when there is anybody <laughs> yes. to listen. Yes. 
So with CLI for Microsoft 365, it's an it's an open source, cross-platform, cross-shell command line tool that you can use to manage Microsoft 365 and SharePoint framework projects. And just past Friday, as we're recording that, we released new version. And there are quite a few cool new things that are a part of version 5.8 that we shipped, amongst which is the ability to execute a request to any API you might want to call. You might ask why. Well, because for one, we don't have the coverage of every single API that there is on Microsoft Cloud. And we're saying specifically, again, Microsoft Cloud, because that might include your custom APIs, right? As long as you have, or as long as CLI is able to access that API you granted the access to, it will automatically get for you the token, do the auth, so that you don't need to do it by yourself, and you can just call the API and get back a response. So this is a pretty cool thing, kind of like curl, you know, the, the command line tool that you can use yep. to call any API but then without you having to fiddling with auth. So it yep. saves you a lot of time, uh, like a bunch of time, right? And then there are some other improvements around permissions, OneNote notebooks, sending emails, and much, 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 much more. So again, give it a try. And again, huge thanks to everybody who helped us bring this version to life. Yep, really, really cool stuff. Uh, continuous involvement in here as well. Now, Community contributions, community-led uh, projects. Uh, Adam Wojciech, um, was that? Yeah, it's actually yes. Wojciech, right? Um, because Adam always um, he keeps on hiding on this this item IT term, so it's like <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> also in Twitter. But he has created two really cool uh, VS Code extensions, and this one was explicitly called out by a few people uh, in the Twitter as well. So PMP PowerShell extension, which helps on actually accessing a script sample gallery directly so you can actually find relevant samples for you to use and then also documentation integration for easy access on the BMP PowerShell command line. Same by the way applies for CLI for Microsoft 365. So right. Adam Wojciech has done the same for both of these. So really, really cool extensions uh, for the Visual Studio code. So awesome stuff. Now, we also wanted to raise this one. So this one is from Prasham uh, Sabardra. Uh, pronunciation, um, not probably quite there, um, but this one is kind of a cool thing, just to call out as a small tip and a tricks. Um, also in the, it's prob probably hashtagged uh, in the Twitter, so we found it, on how to check available licenses in your tenant. So basically understanding what are the license situation, what are the, the last date when the licenses are valid, how many licenses are being used, and where is this information in the admin. As a developer, it's good to know um, to, and, and understand the expiration situation of the tenant potentially and all of that. So really, really cool stuff as well. And it works through where to access that information and how to export that in Excel. Then we had two articles from Mark Anderson. Yes. In this article, he talks about different types of managed properties in search schema in SharePoint online, right? So you, like if you work with search, you might know about the refinable date or refinable string and so forth and so on. And apparently there are a few variations of the refinable string managed properties that you can use when you work with search. So yep. check out the article if you want to know more because these new columns come with new abilities that you might uh, use in your apps. Really cool stuff. Um, also, Mark had a new uh, article related on creating custom content types for stream in SharePoint. And this is really talking about the fact that as we have the baseline stream uh, object uh, for the video, uh, you can basically extend that and include additional metadata uh, on the video object as well, which is really, really cool um, using the, the normal content type inheritance model. Um, and Mark, uh, who is actually the Mark is talking to Mark, and Mark is the. Ross. the Mark Ross. Yep, uh, he is the, the product manager of the stream. So he can basically confirm from Microsoft that you can actually do this and you can inherit things and make things even more efficient. Really, really cool stuff. Then we had an article uh, from uh, Daniel and Daryl related on collaborating Teams meeting with Excel Live. Yeah, I think it was actually, is that a video or a webcast? It is a video, yes, I webcast. Wait. It's the, yes, the, exactly. the Message Center show episode. Uh, where's the episode number? 255. 255. Right there. there we go. Yes. Exactly. I'm flying. Exactly, right? <laughs> Uh, and in this episode, they talk about Excel live in Teams meetings, right? So imagine you have Excel sheet and you want to work with it during a meeting. They talk about 
how does it work and so forth and so on. So check it out if you use Excel for work, because you might just found out about a more efficient way to use it in your um, meetings on Teams. Yep, and one thing to call out also that there's a highlights on the Microsoft Event Digital event from September 20, uh, September 22nd. Uh, that was the event where we introduced a lot of the new Viva capabilities and talks about that as well. So some of them are oh, yeah. now announced, not yet released. So there's quite a big difference on that. So they're not yet available, they're coming. So yeah. Then we have two uh, videos. Uh, Andrew, Andrew Connell from uh, the Voitanos had a great video related on uh, the huge changes in M600 exam, exam in August 2022 update. So there's quite a lot of changes and prioritization on what that exam is covering uh, already available. So if you take the exam, um, this is a great video to have a look on. Uh, is is calling out the big differences where you should be focusing on and, and how do you prep uh, for that certification. And then the last one uh, was with uh, Paolo related on managing document set versions history with Microsoft Graph. I was not aware that this is possible. So today you learn. There you go. Today, today I learned learn how yes, to use Microsoft absolutely. Graph to manage document sets version history. Yep. So list versions, create versions, get versions, delete versions, reserve versions, anything you want to do around document sets through the API. Yep. That's actually really cool. But it's a great example of us improving the API surface the day after day and week after week and adding additional capabilities in the Microsoft Graph as well. So kind of gradually transitioning to the comp um, to the graph to cover all of the main scenarios, which is really, really cool. Cool. We already went through what's going to happen this week uh, with BERT. Uh, anything else on your mind? No, nothing, nothing else. Well, I mean, there's a lot on my mind. Like my <laughs> mind is so busy. Yeah, this is but a family yeah. show, so don't. Yes, exactly. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also let's share under NDA with all our friends. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 let's not do that. Let's not do that. Anyway, I guess that then sums up this week. Um, good, good, uh, good to catch up with Bert. Thank you, Bert, one more time for joining. Uh, good to catch up with you, Waldek, as well. Uh, well, we have quite a few meetings already today on the schedule, <laughs> so which is okay. Uh, my calendar today is just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, twelve, sixteen meetings. So that's good. Um, which is pretty decent. Obviously, I can't take all of them because they're overlapping a bit. But you know, so it's it's good to have demand. I guess. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> But we'll be back with the next uh, BMP Weekly show uh, within next week. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Uh, whatever is the chosen method, please use the hashtag BMP Weekly in the in the Twitter, uh, so we find out all of the great stuff what you've been doing as well. But thanks for now, and keep the feedback coming. Thanks everybody. Have a great rest of the week. See ya.